Welcome back to Streaming Media Connect 2023. I'm your host slash MC slash cartographer, uh, Evan Shapiro. Um, welcome to the panel, Build, Buy, or Both, sourcing the tech stack for your OTT platform. Before we get to that, I want to thank our sponsor, Bango, uh, Bango which I just found out is uh, the word number in Japanese. Um, and there's a whole backstory to that. Hopefully they'll get to it on the panel. Um, for those of you who uh, haven't been with us on a panel, uh, at one of our panels earlier in the week, the first person who can name the song and the band in the chat and who is here at the end of this panel, and everyone's sticking around for this panel because it's going to be scintillating, um, but the first person who can name the song and the band and who is here at the end to collect the prize will get a $50 Amazon gift card from Streaming Media Connect. Put your guesses in the chat. Also in the chat, you'll see things like a link to Streaming Media's YouTube page where you'll be able to see all of the panels from today and all week. Um, those will go up next week. Uh, they'll be live at the link. Um, but you'll also see links to uh, the, the bios and the, and the profiles of the panelists and our host. Um, keep the chat for that and put your questions in the Q&A. They are the cues of the, the Q&A. And at the end, Nadine, our moderator, will ask the panelists your cues and get A's for you back in return. Um, with that, I want to bring our uh, moderator uh, and re regular contributor to Streaming Media uh, Connect and to the magazine itself, Nadine Krefitz. Nadine, uh, have a great panel. Looks like a good Thank one. Thank you. Okay, take it away. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we will be talking about is how everybody here um, has really inspected what they do at a minute level and just figured out the best solution. So we've got Rob, LaShawn, and Anil. And I think one of the interesting things about this panel is that these guys are all from very different areas. So I'll just do a little bit of an introduction for them. So Rob, can you give us a bit of the background between you and STARS? Sure. My name is Rob Collins. I'm a executive director of software development. I come from a software development background. I joined STARS around 2016 when they started getting really into the direct-to-consumer space. Um, I was brought in mainly because of my experience with large-scale systems, so helped build some of those and stuck around. Now I'm more on the management side for ingest, for streaming, for CDM management, a lot, a lot of different uh, teams and responsibilities. Okay, cool. Uh, LaShawn, how about uh, what you do at Reverie? Wow, so um, I actually come from a filmmaking background and we came together um, to start Reverie based on a need for representation in entertainment when it came to LGBTQ content. So um, I'm one of the co-founders of Reverie, which is the largest LGBTQ streaming network. Um, and I handle everything that is from product launch to um, channel launches and media management, and, and as well as just getting things in and getting them out to the customer. Okay, all right. So still a lot of, uh, I'm almost gonna say mechanics in terms of both what Rob and LaShawn do. Anil, Anil's a sponsor of this program and uh, why don't you give us a little bit of background on what Bango is? Sure. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm uh, Anil, and I'm one of the founding team at Bango. Um, and Bango is a technology provider. We form an interesting part of the ecosystem because a lot of the content that folks are consuming, streaming media and other forms of online content, um, is being discovered and activated through um, channels. To, so you can go direct to a content provider, or increasingly nowadays, you can go to somebody like a a broadband provider or a telecommunications company, and you can find a whole range of different content there. Um, and you can activate and discover and activate and consume that content through through a, a channel partner. And the technology that really glues all of that together, glues the telco systems together with the with the um, streaming media uh, content is provided by Bango. So if in the U US, if you look at a proposition like Plus Play, then from Verizon, the Bango technology behind that. Okay. All right, we'll go a little bit further into this in a bit. But first off, I think what I want to get kind of a grounding in is stars and reverie are what I'm going to call as different generations, maybe, um, of uh, streaming companies. I don't know whether we even work in generations any longer, but realistically, I could almost go V.0, V.1. But okay, let's let's go with, you've got services, Rob, that you've been building for a long time. Can you just walk us quickly through kind of what the tech stack is that you did actually have to build in order to get stars 
out online? Sure. Well, I mean, to set the context a little bit, I mean, I think it's fair to talk about generations. I don't think I've I've seen it, um, you know, seen it formalized, but there is, you know, Stars was relatively early in it. I mean, like we started as a premium cable channel back in about 1994. One of our founders was very interested in digital video. So, I mean, there were some experiments, things, uh, you know, working with real networks back in the early 2000, uh, Vongo service, um, you know, things that you, things that you'd be hard to call streaming, but, you know, di online digital video. So, you know, about 2012 is when we really started to do more like kind of a TV everywhere thing and got some experience in streaming. Around 2016, when I joined, there was a couple of things that really made us oriented towards a build shop. One of them being that there was, and management had made the decision, let's, uh, let's control our own destiny. So things like keeping our own user data, keeping, um, you know, managing our CDNs and play out so that we, you know, build up internal kind of expertise so that we we can uh, stay up and stay active and so forth. So there, you know, there, there was kind of a conscious de decision on that. And another thing was just that there wasn't that kind of e vendor ecosystem that you have now. You don't have all these great vendors, you know, so in a lot of cases we, we chose to build. So um, we could probably talk all day about all the technologies we use, just as you know, it's a, it's a very, um, a, a very kind of complex workflow, but some of the things that we that we definitely uh, keep internal is pretty much anything uh, user related. Um, the anything that is uptime with CDNs, content delivery, uh, managing those, and um, you know uh, things like analytics and so forth. So, so okay. those are some things we could draw down on, but that's that's a quick overview. Okay, um, that's. Uh really quite interesting because uh, I mean if I think about some of the things that you are actually owning and controlling they're pretty complex um part of it was because it didn't exist previously when you started to do some streaming um now Reverie you're a different kind of thing um yes uh okay so realistically we had a conversation LaShawn a little while ago and you told me you buy a lot so can you give me a little bit of background as to what, why, et cetera? Well, um, I mean, I'd like to call Reverie's interest, entrance onto the scene in, as the, the part of the streaming renaissance. So, mm -hmm. you know, this, this whole move towards, you know, cord cutting and the whole move towards us really kind of individualizing and compartmentalizing services of, as opposed to buying the big cable package bundles. So, um, we actually started um, with a company called VHX, which is now Vimeo OTT. Uh, we were one of their first enterprise type clients. Um, it made sense for us to come in without a whole lot of startup capital. And I mean, to be honest, I think at the time that we built it and when we inked the deal in like the end of 2015 and had our beta by March of 2016, um, we, I, think, I think the deal was 10K. We la launched on seven platforms with 10K. Which, which is why build, for, I mean, which is why we didn't build, um, just be, by the expense of it. Not to mention that, to be honest, so that we didn't have to have all of those techni technical and engineering services in-house, that's another thing because I actually don't come from a coding background. So um, when we were getting this together and I was like, you know, I don't want to be called a CTO because that is not my experience. So I can, I can, I can manage a product. I can, you know, I can, I can do the things that are related to a product, but as far as managing those engineering teams directly, that is not something that I want to do at this stage in-house. Um, for smaller companies, buying makes a lot more sense because you can customize to your customer base. And unless you're, unless you're coming in with a lot of startup capital build and then some sort of matching marketing initiative, um, it, as a, as a younger company, um, it may not be worth it for you to buy, for, for you to build at, at the onset. Okay. So that's, that's kind of where we started. Okay. And you know, now that every vendor who's listening to this is going to actually hate you because you just mentioned a price, but realistically, um, only because, you know, people never talk prices online, which, you know, we should get more into that. This is a price that doesn't exist, 
probably nobody nobody after us got a deal anything close to that mm-hmm. so i mean yep. we're talking 2015 so i mean th- yeah. this is something that like i mean honestly you there's no one that you could find that would do that for you not okay. not in the way excellent. that we were able to do it it doesn't exist okay anymore. okay so there's no longer a hit out on you no 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 okay excellent all right also vhx it, is no longer a company so technically i'm talking about something that doesn't exist completely true okay they, so they, people they just blob onto apparently. the numbers <laughs> they didn't charge enough. Okay. And Neil, how about, you know, you guys are providing services um, to a lot of telcos in the industry. Um, is what you're doing only for the telcos or would somebody like either one of these companies actually be involved in what you do in terms of offering your service? Yeah, I mean, anybody and everybody with, with a service can take advantage of what we're doing. And I, I guess mm-hmm. the first thing I need to do is I need, I need to make the case for um, why uh, folks like LaShawn and Rob would use um, channel partners like telcos, for example. Mm-hmm. Not just telcos, there are other channel partners as well that can reach consumers en masse. And I think the arguments are probably well understood, and I'm sure they'll be made at the conference during during the, the course of this, uh, this, this few days. Um, you know there is there is massive customer reach that can be achieved if you can get your uh, your content delivered through uh, home broadband, mobile communications, telecommunications channels, not just in the United States but globally as well. Obviously, that's particular interest to so a business like Stars. Um, so so that's that, that's the main argument. But there's also some really interesting evidence that's accumulating that that consumers that are acquired for these services through these indirect channels like telcos tend to hang around longer for all sorts of reasons and we're just beginning to kind of understand why why that might be the case so there's there's goodness for everybody um in in putting together these bundled relationships and bundled partnerships it's it's good for folks with content because they can increase their customer reach there seems to be a a longer lifetime value when customers are acquired through these channels and clearly it's good for the channel partners themselves uh, because they've, they've driven by by motivations like um, uh, re- customer retention, churn reduction, customer retention. They also want to acquire more customers. They want to increase the average revenue per customer in the telco industry. That's a that's a very important uh, KPI that, that that's tracked. So it seems to work really well. The synergy seems to work really well. So so you know, in in case of Bango, we you know, obviously we we believe that um, an increasing sh- number of of consumer subscription services will acquire those services through these channels. And what we're starting to see now is a really interesting um, uh, phenomenon emerging, which we've, we've labeled in the past 12 months, literally super bundling. And I think most folks will be familiar with their telecommunication service provider bundling a Netflix or a Disney Plus or an HBO, those, those, those kinds of phenomena that we all see. But what we're starting to see now is is the the emergence of a role for the telecommunications industry in becoming almost a content hub. So would Super Bundling actually be an individual streaming company like Stars or Reverie, or would it be... It's more company. likely. It's more likely to be somebody who's actually not in the content business themselves. So there's okay. no conflict of interest. So it's more likely to be a T-Mobile, AT and T, Verizon, Comcast, some somebody like that. It could even be a financial institution, and, and certainly in Asia and Europe, we're starting to see some financial services com- companies trying to address that problem of of having a largely undifferentiated first party service by bringing interesting cool new content in and offering that as part of what they, they give to the consumer so so super bundling is like is, is that phenomenon of when you go to t-mobile or you go to verizon plus play right. you can see 20 30 maybe even 40 services all conveniently okay. packaged together for the consumer okay cool all right that sounds very interesting in fact, I mean, you brought up something sir uh, I, was, I was just going to say that uh as anyone i were talking that the we're partners with uh, with bango in a particular um, offering and what he's describing is something that Stars has been involved with for a long time. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's it, the way I think about it is that starting life as a premium cable channel is just, you know we are partnering with all kinds of carriers and so forth. And Stars never really dropped that model. I mean, even in streaming, when every when there were a lot of the new offerings were coming out and kind of trying to be the biggest or um, you know the everything to everyone. Stars didn't really, you know, it's, uh, we've always been kind of like, yeah, you can, subs- you can get us direct to consumer, but you can also have some of the bigger partners that, uh, that you can probably guess. And, um, you know, also the kind of thing that Anil's describing where it's not just the um, Disney's or 
or Amazons, but also some of the telcos um, around the world. And, you know, even some, uh, there, there's one that I, that I wish I could remember what it was, but it was almost like a shopping kind of uh, service that is that is massive that we, you know, also partner with. Okay. In fact, I, I know that Reverie also does a lot of, um, this, would we call it distribution deals or partnerships? How do you call it, Lashan? Um, we usually call them the part their partnerships uh, okay. because a lot of the a lot of the channels that we're that we're working with, we also kind of coordinate with them on marketing efforts. So it's okay. it's not just hey here's a channel thanks goodbye you know it's it's a hey here's a channel and here's what we're doing in this month or here's what we're doing for this holiday or here's what we're doing for this initiative or Pride's coming up and we have all this content that you know you may be interested in featuring because you know Reverie's doing this 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 and this so you know it's it's more of a partnership and and to be honest that's really what we look for especially as a smaller streamer like mm -hmm. we we need we need and want those partnerships for the same reason that you that you're saying like you know you you you're you're a part of a larger ecosystem okay well how do we get get to one percent of their ecosystem three percent of their ecosystem five percent of their ecosystem so those are the things that we're looking to do with a partnership grow that relationship with that company as well as with their with their user base okay so in this sense essentially the use case or the business proposition that a vendor has for both of you for your companies Rob and LaShawn um, is really doing something that you couldn't possibly do in in-house is, is that kind of how you see it well, it's it's yes. And because the, the reality of things is that people like to watch where they like to watch. Mm -hmm. my, my 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 dad watches Dish and he only watches Dish. And like when J Dish was losing channels, they complained, but they didn't leave Dish. So so, you know, if, if you're a Dish customer and I want to reach you, then I need to start doing business with dish mm -hmm. you know and so so that's why it matters for the partnerships and why you you why you want to expand out to other platforms okay and, well, let me go and I'll, I'll take a nuance of your question there nadine sure. uh, there's yeah. um I, I agree with uh, everything that sean just said but the whether we can do it in house it kind of depends on how you look at it the the kind of thing that bango does we're happy to partner with them where they have expertise and and um, in their geography, but we have an entire department that does works on those partnerships. So this is a case where we're doing, you know, sometimes it is stars only. Sometimes it is working with uh, partners like like Anil. Okay. And by the way, that's that's an important point I think Rob and Lashaw both make, which is that what we can do is we can take those standard services, technology and operational services that everybody does in every instance where you're doing a partnership. So there's a whole bunch of things that everybody does every time you do one of these partnerships. Mm -hmm. And quite quite honestly, there's no point doing that in-house because it's it's it basically is repeated work. We have this concept, if you go to bango.com, we've, we've come up with this concept we call a digital vending machine. And the mm -hmm. idea of that is really to kind of visualize the fact that a lot of what you need to do is just standard every single time. So put it into a standard technology deployment, deploy it uh, inexpensively and quickly wherever you want. However, where, where people like um, Reverie and, and, and Stars do need to partner directly with their channels is when it does come to the event-driven marketing that Sean was was talking about and Rob was talking about, you know, the very, you know, bring, bringing new services and programming and that kind of thing to market. Um, and, and that's the bit where you know, I, I think one of the reasons we exist is that we remove all of that technology and operational overhead away from the partnership so that you can concentrate on building great partnerships and doing the right marketing and doing the right targeting. Okay. So I, we can go two different directions with this. I'm going to hit up data first only because I think that um, Rob mentioned this earlier and I know that I've had conversations with Reverie before. So Owning your own data, that means that you can, it especially applies to marketing, but it, it, you know, Rob, you went there so that you could own your own data. LaShawn, what happens when you want to have a lot of targeting on the personal data for your, your viewers based on what your tech stack looks like? Um, well, it, it really is. There are some limitations when it comes to different platforms. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, everybody's familiar with um, different things where people have uh, taken their their CDN back, and that's caused us not to get the same level of data that we were, you know, getting previously. Um, you, we're basically, you know, you find the creative ways to kind of kind of look at 
metrics and you know figure out what your what your common denominator is because to be honest not even everyone is giving you the same level of data whether it's sessions or views or impressions or you know whatever watch time yeah um so therefore you internally have to figure out what your metrics are going to be because the industry doesn't have a standardization yet um and from there you kind of you kind of just look at what's working you know mm -hmm. is is this resonating we can tell what the users are doing whether what, with whether the content is resonating or not. So we we are very much a very content focused um, medium when it comes to things like um, just making sure that that things are resonating with people. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and and what the reason I'm bringing up personalized data is that it's often something that's used for advertising targeting. Um, but Rob, you don't have advertising. Um, what correct. would you use your data for in terms of your outreach um i mean the, the stars lives and dies if we have programming that people want to watch so right. the i mean the whole thing is do we get viewership do we um, get renewals do we get new customers and so forth so there's you know there we we try to capture all, all the information about what a certain person will watch and what they're likely to watch. And that even goes into programming, you know, decisions of what, uh, you know, the, the slate of shows coming up and so forth. So we, you know, we've got a certain audience and here's what they respond to. So let's uh, you know, try to re really hone in on those. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's extraordinarily important to have, have that kind of thing, but um, you know, since, since there's not a, not, not a, revenue source for advertising it's can we can we get programming that people like okay I, you know the other so the other thing i was thinking about was the evaluation of whether or not you need something new for your workflow so i think this is a really interesting point just because you know especially if you're considering using bango you're considering using any vendor how do you start evaluating it i know this sounds like a question that is so simple that anybody could answer it but i think each company has a different way to evaluate a vendor. So LaShawn, when you're thinking about something you need, what do you, you know, what's your checklist look like? Uh, first I look at um, what's available. Mm -hmm. um, then I look at where that fits into our current ecosystem and whether or not it's going to work for us at their cost point and at scale. So it, it, it's, a, it's, it's often at the end of the day, a cost versus scale conversation. You know, are is is this cost worth our time, effort, energy? Is it is it an easy workflow to use? Is it something that doesn't take an, an absorbent amount of time for us to implement or for for us to use or for us to get tech support on if we if we need that kind of support? Um, a, a term that we've been kind of kicking around in house a lot is business in a box. You know, we're we we often look for services that are self-contained, meaning they're they're not you know development services over here and you know like a customer service over here and this over here because those things make a difference in in response time and in in how soon you can get to your your answers and get to get to troubleshooting. So um, we really look at all of all of the factors, but after after basically combing through what's available um, and and whether or not it's going to work with our current implementation implementation in live apps, um, we then look at whether or not cost versus cost versus our scale. Okay, so Rob, why don't I just go to Anil first, and then I'll come back to you, just because I want to make sure that we incorporate everyone into the conversation. So, Anil, what are some of the things on the opposite side? that you're saying to customers when they start to ask you questions? I, I suppose when I think about it, it fund, at some point, sooner or later, it boils down to revenue opportunity. And mm -hmm. the, 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 the most obvious uh, factor influence on that is how quickly can I get to market? So if this is something I have to build, build it's, it's, it, logically you'd think it's probably going to take me longer than if it's built already out there. You would expect that normally, wouldn't you? You'd expect if something's pre-built, you should be able to deploy it faster. Um, so obviously one of the things that people come to us for is, hey, you've done this before, hence the digital vending machine idea. Um, could we deploy your digital vending machine in our context, in our environment, so that we can offer the, the services we want to offer? And um, it's in, then the, almost the first or second question we get asked is, how quickly could we go live if we mm -hmm. went to you? 
And that, that's fundamental. So why do you want to go to market quickly? I mean, there are lots of reasons why, but fundamentally, the faster you go to market, the faster you can start kicking revenue off from, from, from this part of the business. Okay. Um, it also clearly works well for, for all parties because um, one of, the, one of the, the second question, third question we get asked is, where are you connected already? So again, using that kind of Bango digital vending machine metaphor, if we can make the case that this vending machine is deployed everywhere where you want to go, then there's clearly an overwhelming argument for for coming to somebody like us. Okay, Rob, I got to go back to you because I know that you've you, you mentioned to me that while I think that you you know initially it sounded like you you build everything, that's not quite true, right? You you you're doing a lot of work with your vendors, et cetera. So, yeah, yeah. so how's, what's your evaluation process? Absolutely. I mean, there's a there couple couple different uh, dimensions on this. I mean. In one sense, we have, uh, you know, over the years we've built working systems. So one of the things we have when we're evaluating vendors is we kind of have a, a higher bar of saying, is this particular technology so much better than what we have now that we're going to be able to replace a working system and get uh, better revenue, better um, you know, make people's work more efficient and so forth. Some sometimes that's yes. Um, the so that's that's one piece of it. And then I'll, I'll give you an example. Probably the most interesting journey we've had over the years was uh, recommender systems. I mean, you know, everybody's talking about recommendation and personalization. We've been doing that for a long time, and we've uh, we we built something in house, and it worked well. And we've probably for many years, it feels like we've, we've had vendors that say, we've got you know, the, the greatest thing to, to, that you can use. Uh, we've tried them out, found them lacking. We finally found about a year ago to, you know, had a, had a big partner who is uh, you know, one, one of the biggest companies in the world. And the, we really went into A-B testing and saying, because you know, they, they seem to have uh, a, um, a better solution, at least uh, ostensibly, and they're you know where we were never going to hire as many PhDs as they have. They probably have more <laughs> you know AI PhDs than we have employees at Star. So we um, said, yeah, well, we'll partner with you. And essentially, what we ended up doing is repurposing our in-house system, but giving them the engine and and um, you know so that they. We say, here's you know our uh, watch data. Here's the um, you know some of the personal data and so forth. And here's the kind of thing that they watch. So it, you know it's that one's been interesting because you know some things we started like for instance payment systems where we said we're not going to build that in house. So from the beginning, have been working with partners and so forth. Um, but the recommender was let's build it because that's the best uh, available. But as the market has matured, we've we've gone that direction. Okay. In some ways, I don't think it's fair that we're still calling this panel "Build versus Buy" because realistically, we should figure out a new title. Um, <laughs> it sounds like everybody is, you know, the integration points are are really what's important. But um, you know, Rob and Lashawn, I want to ask you guys. If you had to point out one particular thing in your tech stack that you that is really important to your business that you either built or, or bought, you know, and this isn't really a fair question just because they haven't had notice on this one, what would it be? Um, you, you know, picking one thing and then tell me whether you built it or bought it. I'll hit you up well, first. Okay. Yeah. No. I can. I can. I can do that. I mean, I think that. Um, so for us, fast is a huge part of our business. Um, our, our live linear channels are, are, you know, very essential and, and critical to, to our business model. So I would say that, that, that frequency, our, our, um, vendor for play out is, is integral to, to what we do, um, their flexibility and the way that they've been able to build their product, the way that they've been able to do things, um, to support our initiatives and, you know, conversations that we have had, like, Hey, what about this thing? And, you know, we, there, there's somebody that we can really talk to and kind of, kind of build, build and grow with. So um, I, I, I think that they're really, really critical to what we do. Okay. Um, Rob. I would say both for well, maybe uh, cultural reasons and the, and just um, business reasons, the, 
the team that we built up for managing our application, um, like a cloud engineering team who basically just keeps the, you know, keeps, keeps uh, delivery. The reason, uh, I mean, it's, it might be too deep to go into, but um, again, some of those, you know, er early on, there were some um, playback failures that were, that we, you know, we felt, or the management at the time felt like they were fairly high profile. I mean, looking back as far as, as, as big as a streaming, uh, streaming market has gotten there, you know, not, not that many people are mad, but um, just, just keeping things up, um, being able to, uh, being able to get the logging and, you know, the analytics that we have, the, that, that kind of core business. Um, I, there's probably, we're probably in a world now where the uh, reliability and uptime is, there's plenty of vendors who can handle that, but it's still, you know, an important part of our core business, both for our tech team, management team, and just the way we go to market. I mean, the the we have we we have some shows that are much much. I mean, that that are kind of event shows that people will they learned that they if they come in to uh, we'll release them at ten o'clock on Mountain Time, you know, like uh, midnight Eastern Time. So we'll have these huge spikes. You know, they'll they'll be going from low to super high. So that was you know having that up and having uh, having that available for the our most dedicated customers is is so important that we probably would never uh, outsource it even if uh, I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of vendors who could probably handle that these days okay all right so we still got one on each side of the fence here great cool so um how about do you guys have questions for each other because i can continue on with my questions but you know i figured that since you're all here and you're all in different businesses you might want to chat among yourselves well, I'm, I'm still a woozy from uh, LaShawn's 10K number. <laughs> uh, see, I told you there's going to be a hit out. I think, I think that that number, I mean, yeah, I, I'm still woozy from it because to be honest, like it's, it's not even, yeah, there's, that doesn't exist. It's, it's almost like, yeah, you remember that thing, the, the radio, people always listen to that. No, um, I'm kidding. Um, no, but I mean, I think that what I would want to know is how, like, as far as a tech stack is concerned, like, like, what is, what is the biggest change that you've seen in your tech stack from, from kind of, I would say in the last 10 years, because not even, not even so much from when you started, but just in the last 10 years. Is this for Rob or Anil? Yeah, for Rob. For Rob. Yeah. Uh, just the, the cloud. I mean, the, the, the short answer is to that. Um, because if we, well, I got to figure out what year it is now, but if you go back, uh, if you go back 10 years, um, that was just kind of a, a merging and there's still, I mean, we've almost gotten rid of everything out of the workflow, but there's you know, being around since 94, there's still some, um, stuff that on the other side of like the linear channel that is not cloud enabled. I mean, DTC, we, we went cloud from the beginning, but it was, um, yeah, just just go ahead, just, just making that workflow. So again, that that's kind of where I'm going when I say that there's you know so many vendors that have learned those lessons of scale that it would be easier to do now. Like um, like as I hear you're doing of kind of uh, uh, outsourcing that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, for 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 CMS and cloud, uh, like we're we're um, our core developer right now is Brightcove, Brightcove, and um, they uh, develop our apps. They're our CMS. Uh, we do some level of partner distribution through them um, when it comes to individual video files, um, MRSS feeds out, and you know that kind of thing. Um, so, so yeah, we and they're 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 an industry leader, so so very solid CMS, and and you know that's that's something that we can rely on. And I mean, obviously, you know, cloud services have changed over time, and you know they've gotten better, and they figured out the what region you need to be connecting to, and you know you're not getting a lot of lag. So, you know, I, I'm pretty happy with the with the you know that part of the service for sure. Okay. Anil, yeah. the, I mean, I'm I'm only familiar with uh, what the conversations we've had, um, you know, through the partner channel, and also I understand, like uh, in the UK, do you, do you have? I mean, do you have like a worldwide presence? Are you mainly UK? Yeah, 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 yeah. We do, and, and and thinking about cloud services, actually, that um, one of the questions we get asked a lot by by customers is is our ability to deploy their services globally. So even if even if from the get go, it might be a a region. They they certainly want to know that if they use our technology and that, that our tech stack uh, can support. And I, you know, I agree with you, Rob, on the you know the, the fact that cloud has transformed the way these the, this can be done. 
Um, but even quite recently, funnily enough, probably in the last three or four years, we, we've dealt with RFPs from, from prospective customers where they've been asking us about our data center strategy, which is kind of curious in the world of, the world of cloud deployment. So there's still some, uh, still some legacy thinking going on there, but clouds really change everything. And then you know, it helps us answer that question about global deployment uh, much more easily. But uh, e even with cloud architectures, there are some questions we have to think about. So there are a number of markets where, for example, consumer data has to be stored locally. So we have to know that we were able, were able to do that. So you're a global company, but you're not allowed to export certain data out. So you have to know that your architecture and the design of your architecture allows you to have uh, local data storage, for example. So those those are those are some key key points that we have to have to be mindful of. Um, but it's in the nature of this business, and you guys will know, know this, you know, at least as well as, as I do, that uh, you get very seasonal behavior, you get very event-driven behavior. You, you mentioned, Rob, about the ability to handle sudden demand surges, those, those kinds of things. So we've, we've essentially had to build a platform that in terms of its ability to handle event-driven spikes is probably years ahead of what the average capacity demand is. Um, but but you know, again, cloud helps, helps you meet that need. Rob, did you say you you don't run your own CDM, but you manage it, right? Uh, we have uh, several CDM vendors that we work with, yeah. Okay. And right. So we, I mean, we we have uh, you know management of how we push out origin storage and how we um, you know move traffic and that kind of thing. Okay. All right. I was going to say that's probably the one. I was going to say it's the one area that where everybody is going to buy. But I have one person on a panel who told me they were building a CDN. Um, and uh -huh. uh, that surprised me. That was Globo. So Globo has a different kind of environment, a big country to cover. Um, so I wouldn't say now that it's always going to be uh, something you buy. But OK, so let's move on to, in fact, how about the measurement in the cloud? So are you guys, you know, if this is something you always have to buy, are you getting the right reporting you feel from your cloud providers so that you actually know what you're doing there, what you're paying? So I, I can probably uh, start that one just because LaShawn had uh, kind of an interest, uh, interesting point on that earlier is I agree 100% that there's a difference between the you know what CDNs can give you and or just vendors in general that there's even when they are giving you coverage on data they don't necessarily have it structured the same and they don't uh, you know some are better than others that kind of thing the what we did uh, rolling it our own was harder and I mean it's harder to maintain but at the same time we. Um, it gives us more freedom to uh, to use it and it and to kind of um, even when we have a multi CDN um, setup that we can compare apples to apples as as we run through our analytics. Yeah, Lashawn, anything else, or should I move on to another question? Oh, uh, probably, probably you you can move on because I'll probably like what I would say would be the the same thing. I mean, it's just about it's, you have to figure out what your what your common denominator is. You know, and, and the, the way that things are structured now, it forces you to have to do that, um, unfortunately. But I mean, you know, it's we're 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 moving forward into the, the future, so I'm hoping for good things with um with some you know standardization. So, okay, um, you know, the the next question I was thinking about was not necessarily you know build versus buy, but and this is for all of you is what do you think the next big tech problem is that you're going to solve that's obviously related to streaming because that's why we're here. Um, and Neil, why don't you kick us off here on yeah. just that? Um, I, I took, I'll, let me start off by saying where I think it's going to come from. I'm actually really mm -hmm. interested in, in uh, Rob and Sean's views on, the, on this, which is um, we're starting to spend more time now thinking about what the consumer experience should should be like over the next five year cycle. Even that, even that, that's a long that's a long way out. Um, the way in which streaming services generally are experienced by consumers is it's quite vanilla uh, but i think by and large and, and we're starting to see expressions of interest from consumers and having a bit more control over how they consume subscription services and this again comes back to the the, the, the role that these 
super bundling content hubs have, where one of the things they potentially can do is allow consumers to have more flexibility over which subscriptions are switched on, which are at any particular point in time. At the moment, the, the, uh, the approach to consuming a streaming service tends to be, as I said, it's quite vanilla. It tends to be build on the same kind of billing cycle. Price points are generally quite standardized. But really the only way of, of stopping spending money with a subscription service is by canceling it. Um, and that's, that I think overall is a poor consumer experience because there's a lot behind cancelling your, your consumption of a service. It, it's, it's like a termination event. And what we, we found with market research is quite a lot of consumers actually would like to pause for a period of time. Um, they don't want to break their relationship with the service. They just want to pause it. Uh, and they'd like to be able to re-engage at some point in the future. Um, and so I think, you know, the, 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 the next kind of developments we want to see are really more about the design of the service than necessarily a specific technological breakthrough. Um, but I think it will take some kind of um, some, some deeper thinking about what, what consumer experience is like, some financial modeling about what the implications of, of giving consumers that, that greater level of control over how they spend money with, with their services. Um, okay. But I think that, that, that's the area where I think it's important for us as a, an industry to spend more time thinking through. Okay. All right. So the consumer control. Um, LaShawn, what about you? What are you thinking of in terms of the new area or the thing that you're, you know, will be important to you? I mean, honestly, I, I, I agree about the consumer. And, and I think that there, there's something to be said for, for uh, uh, the fact that we're so far into digital video consumption that consumers are really savvy. You know, I mean, we've had this kind of, YouTube style model for, for lack of a better way to say it, where, you know, the video is here, the playlist starts from left to right. Like there's some very consistent things about the way that things are done, but what do consumers really want? And yes, there's a data part to that, but your data, when you're getting it after a person has gone into your ecosystem is really after the fact, they're going to give you feedback based on what you built not based on what's possible, not based on what they want. So I think that there's some level of looking at consumers outside of the ecosystems as well, um, whether that's market research or other things. Um, for us, we also kind of want to make sure that when we're looking at tech tools, that for the most part, we can get as much information and data out of our out of the, the the software that we're using and out of the development that that we were that we're doing in-house without having to add or, or or do anything with additional services because that will allow us to augment and say okay I'm getting robust information about um, user demographics or whatever else whatever metric it is but what I really like is some information about this. So let me find a vendor that I can plug in that gives me what I'm not already getting from my co my core service. Um, okay. and, and that's that's kind of really where it is. All right, so that's interesting. So intelligence in terms of what the consumer wants, but not what's actually already being used. Okay, all right, Rob, l let's flip over to you and just see if there's another area or whether you're just gonna agree with these two, but. Uh, hopefully, think you find um, another area. I, I am in heated agreement with them. Um, okay. we, there's there's quite a uh, uh, you know uh, the, there's quite a bit of talk of consolidation, and you know there's we've reached peak streaming, and we can't, can't sustain everybody being everything. So that's uh, you know the the kind of uh, you know the, the the dreaded going back to the cable carrier model. Um, it seems to be on its way back in. From SARS perspective, we never really abandon that. You know, I mean, there's never we've uh, as as new streamers, big streamers come online and say, yeah, it's uh, a pirate partner. Like uh, as Anil mentioned, there's when you have uh, you know worldwide, you have some telcos. Let's partner with you guys too. There's you know that's a, that's a very kind of uh, forward looking thing. Um, but the I mean that that feels like the biggest thing in uh, just from a business wise um, tech. Tech-wise, I mean, there's the, the elephant in the room, of course, is the is generative AI. I mean, it's uh, something that, depending on your point of view, it's uh, exploded into the hype cycle quickly, or is has been uh, slow simmering for a while before it uh, before it hit that hype peak. Just because, you know, if uh, I only half jokingly say that uh, that Clippy was a was a uh, early early incarnation of the large language model, but, uh, you know. 
Okay, I listen. promise you guys we'll, we will go to Gen AI next, but I have a question that came in the ch chat window for LaShawn. So LaShawn, uh, you mentioned listening to users and meeting them where they are. How are you thinking about optimizing your tech stack to better understand viewer behavior and what they care about, asks Ian Landis. Um, so this is where I think a, a company like like Bango can be can be helpful, and and well, where I've I've met with a few companies that um that that can do some things. I think that that um, in app surveys, and if you gamify them and 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 use use prize models to be able to get that that information from them, because we are in a time of public privacy, so you know you can have an experience where everything is completely customizable at a cost of you know all of your information so and a lot of people are very reluctant to do that so when you're talking about like i would i, I would really like to implement and, I, and i've talked to vendors that can do this but but um implementing like in-app surveys so hey you know if you're if you're not a subscriber or if you're a subscriber you get to watch this special video um, or this special movie, we have a, a movie that like, if you answer this survey, or if you, if you give us this, this bit of data, you know, that's a way to do it in, in, in app. Um, I mean, there are external factors that, that you can use to do that as well. But I mean, I, I would rather keep people in the ecosystem as much as possible. Okay. All right. All right. Let's go jump back to Gen AI. So, um, you know, yesterday we had a panel that was very engaged with a lot of different questions, but, um, where would you guys like to start on this topic? Is it more on how you are building things now or what you're talking about to vendors? Any preference? I'm very democratic. So uh, I mean, okay. I, I can, for the most part, I mean, I, for, for us um, internally at, at the moment, only, only as of today, um, I think that we use it more um, for things like uh, for captions. Mm -hmm. That's where we're, that's where we get the most benefit out of it. So even if you're, you know, like, like it's, it's, it's not a hundred percent. So, you know, you send something, it, it, it spits something out for you. And then a member of my team will go in and adjust those captions. So for us, like on a day to day, that's really how we're using it. Um, I find a lot of the conversations really fascinating, especially when it comes to copyright. Um, I think that's going to be a really big conversation to come up um, and, and, you know, to see how legislation is going to go around it, what kind of legislation we're going to get around it. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's kind of one of the things that I've been thinking about over the last couple of days. Okay. So titling that's, that makes sense. Um, you know, Anil, why don't we go to you since, uh, you know, Rob brought it up. We'll go to you <laughs> and then back to Rob. So. Yeah. Yeah, um, um, yeah, I don't know where we are on hype cycle. I mean, we're, we're uh, you know, the, the hype may uh, may uh, be uh, predicting some some real impact that generative AI is going to have. I think I think it will do. In in our particular area, obviously, what we're we're really interested in doing is bringing the worlds of entertainment and, and online content together with the worlds of distribution, particularly tele uh, telcos, telephony, and other kinds of distribution. So, quite a lot of what we do. Is taking our vending machine, as I've said, and gluing it together with the infrastructure of, of telecommunications companies. So there, there's quite a lot of work to do to build sort of adaptation interfaces. That's potentially quite repetitive work. And so people have already started talking about generative AI as being able to generate code, particularly code that's, that's um, workmanlike, repeated quite a lot. Um, so we could see, I potentially see generative AI being very, very useful for code generation. I think we're a little ways off that. I don't think the world of software development is under a major threat yet, but certainly a lot of tasks in building the infrastructure and putting the infrastructure together could be automated, or at least semi-automated. And I think that's an area where at Bangor we're, we're particularly interested over the next few years and how we can mm -hmm. use generative AI to make this whole process quicker. Okay. All right. All right. So we got the the efficiency. We've got we got the copyright, which is really a very interesting topic. Rob, Gen AI. So what do you think about in terms of your workflow and and you know where you might kind of spend more time, further than what you just talked about? Yeah, I mean the all the all these topics could uh, could be be their own panel. Obviously, I mean the the copyright our, our legal team is scrambling to. Figure out, you know, uh, where where the dangers are. You know, I mean, like if we if we have a title, uh, you know, if my our parent company Lionsgate has John Wick, and 
we generate some John Wick images. Is that is that okay? So though that's that's a whole different can of worms. But the uh, you know what what Anil is saying is I I think that when we get to the kind of productivity cycle of this, there's unquestionably we're going to have it's going to raise the level of what is uh, automatable. That there's you know things like in the in code there's um, you you can uh, a lot of things that are boilerplate or uh, testing th those kind of things are already you know there, there's there's already benefit getting out of that um, captions as as Lashawn says and um, there, there's just a number of things I mean just as it gets smarter you can do things like um, post-production editing and so forth. So I, I don't, I mean, it, it doesn't, uh, I, the, where, where, where the hype really gets out of control is again, when somebody says, well, we'll never need software developers again, or, you know, <laughs> that's, we don't need, uh, we don't need editors for, for video and so forth. No, I mean, you can make the, make them more efficient, but I don't, I don't see that happening uh, okay. anytime real soon. Probably none of us are saying that you don't need developers anymore. I don't think that there's anyone who really is actively involved in this industry who would say that. But anyway. Well, uh, I've heard that since I was but a, but a wee lad. Yes. And <laughs> people say it. I think it's just uh, something to antagonize you. So anyway, let's move on to the next question here. Uh, Wayne Goldstein asks, um, who is in the best position to provide some measurement standardization that eases your pain point around disconnected metrics? So Good thing we're going back to data here. Um, who would like to hit, hit this one? Not, not sure exactly what he's asking there. Is he just saying like, okay, are we, um, like who is the best? Like who's in the best position to provide some measurement standardization that eases your pain point? Okay, so so realistically, if you need certain metrics, say from your CDN, from your ad server, not you, Rob. Um, um, can your vendors actually take a leading step and kind of help you and not just create another standard? Or is there a particular area that, you know, to me, for instance, the ad ID thing is, is one area, but um, do any of you have an opinion on who is in the best position to provide measurement standardization? in any area within streaming because there's a lot of a lot of unique areas. I mean, I think that the the OTT and streaming industry definitely is in need of standardization. I mean, there's 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 Cinti, you know, like there mm -hmm. there could be some multi multi group option because it can't just be one one body. It has to be a, a group of people coming together to make a decision about standardization because mm -hmm. the vendors can't do it on their level because they can't enforce it anywhere else. So right. it, it's not on the onus of the vendors at this point to say, okay, sessions, that's the metric. Everybody should be looking at sessions because no one would agree with that. I don't, I, I don't think a lot, of, I think a lot of people would not agree with that, but um, I think that, that it, it's going to come out of a larger body or groups of, and organizations, organizations like IAB and and like the and like um, the Independent Streaming Streaming Alliance that 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 Reverie was was a part of starting. I mean, I think that these are the ways, and especially when it comes to advocating for smaller streamers, um, that's part of part of the thing because we we absolutely need um, common data metrics. Things that are not necessarily infringing upon upon you know somebody's business model or you know intellectual property, but something that gives everyone a baseline for what they're working with. Is this is this a discussion about how we measure rather than what we measure? Because I don't think trying to standardize what we measure is particularly useful. Because given our customer base, of course there is commonality over what what data points people want. But but people use their data differently. They want different data points. They ask us different the whole different things the whole time. But I think defining, to, to use a basic example that just came up, what is a session? What constitutes a session? What constitutes a unique mm -hmm. user, unique event? That would be useful. It seems self-evident, but actually standardizing how we measure things that we say are oh, this is probably where, where the focus needs to be rather than what we measure, because I think people want different things. Uh, that's always, I mean, uh, forever been a difficult uh, nut to crack I mean, I think that it kind of feels like just having seen other industries that have their their life cycles 
it feels like we're kind of getting to the spot where we can be there, where, where you can make a meaningful standard. But both of what you're, what you're saying are true is that there's, yes, there's commonalities. Yes, people want individual, uh, you know, they want customization and, and so forth. So it's, it, it's a tough one to do, but uh, the, the need is certainly there. You know, I, uh, I've got a couple questions in the chat and I wanna to try to um, slightly edit them down just to get um, a quick ability to cover this. Uh, so um, Corey Sanders talks about uh, lifetime value. And so realistically, um, each of you is probably gonna even look at lifetime value in a different way. Um, why don't we first look at the question of, so Anil, when you're running your business, is that one of the things that you really think about with your customers is what is this lifetime value of a customer or do the customers come and ask you, can we figure this out for our customers? We know it's important for our customers. We know it's one of the most important. A nice segue from the discussion just now about measurement. We know it's one of the most important things that they want to measure is lifetime value. And they want to see the impact of content, of offer, of price, of distribution, of bundle, of you know, timing, all sorts of things, timing factors uh, on how that impacts lifetime value. So it is, it's, re it's really important from, from our customer's perspective. Um, so it is one of the things that we're really, really keen to try to, to measure and, and um, help them report back on. But in particular, it's, it's, it's the ability to do testing, maybe testing more sophisticated, maybe testing. Does this particular proposition generate higher lifetime value than another proposition? I, I made a statement at the beginning of this this conversation that there's some initial evidence suggesting that when people um, acquire services, subscription services through third party bundles, they tend to hang around longer. Um, so we need to build up that evidence base and substantiate that, then figure out why is that the case? I mean, it's a positive, but why is that the case? Okay. If Rob and LaShawn, you don't feel like answering this question, I have another slightly different question that's still on the same topic, but do you have comments that you want to make on what just came up from the uh, audience about lifetime I, value? I mean, the one thing the one thing that I'll that I'll add is that is that there you know we have we have different types of users. So um, lifetime value of a user, I would have to at a minimum break it down from our ad supported customers versus our, our versus our subscription model customers because that's that's not they're 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 not the same customer. And so you can't, you can't really say, you know, you, you can do that for an AVI customer and you can do that for an SVI customer, but combining them would take another, a whole other set of metrics. Okay. Rob, anything or shall I'm, we move on? I'm going to punt on this one just because I've got a whole cadre of folks at my uh, company who, who eat and drink and, you know, live this stuff. So I'm, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm mildly aware of it, but. Okay. Okay, in fact, so here's a little bit of a twist on this. So you've got build versus buy. If you guys, if LaShawn and Rob, if you had to figure out a lifetime value on a theoretical level, would you build the software to do this or would you buy it? Um, LaShawn, I'll go to you first. It depends on capital, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it depends on capital for, for, for the, for because it's not just, just about the money that it takes to build your, your, your app or your service or your device. It is also whether or not you can market that device because so so it's it, it really to at the end of the day for that comes down to money whether or not you okay. build versus buy okay rob i'm going to give you the last word we actually let time get away because i was so engrossed in what we were talking about yeah i mean the the biggest kind of question is capital i mean stars had a linear channel had a built-in user base you know didn't need outside funding we we're profitable so we, we built it up that way there's certainly some advantages at the same time I'd also say your uh, viewership model as well I mean we're the stars is, is fairly big but there's you know some of the fast channels some of the things that are more niche interest that I think it makes a whole lot more sense to say you know let's let's offload this and um, if it works great if not we're only out 10k okay. 10k excellent all right well I, you know i hate to cut us off but we're out of time um so build versus buy we still have no specific answer um we do need to have a streaming dictionary in order to define some of these terms that we're coming up with and uh i guess stay tuned for more generation of common metrics um i have to hand this back to uh end the session but thank you all for joining us and uh, as promised um, if we haven't gotten to your question we will try to get to it later on thank you
Yeah, uh, thanks, Nadine. Thanks, uh, Rob and Lashawn and Anil. That was uh, that was fantastic. Um, okay, perfect. And great. I am just going to uh, thank everyone for uh, for joining us for a great panel. And uh, also, I want to acknowledge our winner for the uh, for the gift card, um, Adrian Rowe. Come on down. Uh, Adrian correctly identified uh, Galaxy 500's instrumental. And uh, and uh, come on back at uh, what is it uh, two thirty Eastern time. Uh, we're going to be back with Edmund Shapiro in the both in the MC seat and the moderator seat, doing premium to freemium monetizing top end content in twenty twenty three. And it's a it's an amazing panel. So uh, all right, we'll see you all then. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.